Following the trail of the Cathars allows us to discover one of the most beautiful parts of France and to understand the realities of one of the many religious heresies. It is a mythical trip on the path of truth, the path of history far from cliches and common household images. This story is to be appreciated and respected as much as the land which saw its passing and the heritage that it left behind and even today the signs of its presence. Welcome to Cathar Country. One of its finest jewels is the medieval town of Carcassonne, capital of the department of Aude. Carcassonne is the very heart of the Cathar country and the best starting point for this initiation into its mysteries. Walking along the medieval streets of the town plunges one into another world, a world of history and a completely different atmosphere. There is a feeling of going several centuries back in time. Looking at the ramparts, it is easy to understand that the Middle Ages were insecure times. Towns were almost self-sufficient and exchanges with outsiders were very limited. In these difficult times, man brushed with death on a daily basis. Even so, death remained a mystery and a source of fear. Only religion offered hope and a reason for living. There are several ways to get to Cathar country. One of the most original is to travel on the Canal du Midi. This canal was built in the 17th century to link the Mediterranean to Toulouse. It is UNESCO World Heritage listed. To understand the mentality of a man or woman living in France in the early 12th century, one must understand the role and power that the Christian religion held at the time. Life and one's very existence were marked by it. Years went by punctuated by religious festivals and celebrations, and days by the sound of the church bells. St. Papul Abbey, to the west of the Black Mountains, was very famous in the 10th century for the miracles attributed to St. Berenger, a lord of Toulouse who ended his life in penitence and sainthood. The fame and riches of the monastery were known far and wide.
Today, it is better known for its large collection of the work of the Master of Cabestani. Visiting the collection is an open-air guide to the Christian faith. Now occupied by the Museum of Arts, the Bishop's Palace in Narbonne has the appearance of a true palace. Inside its decoration rivals the castles of the greatest lords. This is indeed how the bishops lived, like lords. They received taxes or tithes, and administered their vast domains and considerable amount of property. The Archbishop of Narbonne possessed for his pleasure summer residences such as Villerouge Termenes Castle. The decoration inside is at odds with the austerity of the castle. It recalls ancient art and foreshadows the Renaissance period with its frescoes and paintings of profane inspiration. The church was organized according to a very complex hierarchy. At the basis were curates and priests, then bishops and archbishops, and finally, at the apex, reigning from the Vatican in Rome, was the Pope, the Holy Father of all Christians, heir of Saint Peter. In the early 13th century, the Holy See was positioned as the natural suzerain of all Catholic countries, since its mission was universal. There is a unique restaurant in Villa Rouge Termenez, the only one of its kind in Europe. La Rotisserie is located inside the very walls of the castle. It is open all year round and takes you back to the 14th century with historical surroundings and dishes. Everything here plunges you back into the life of the Middle Ages in a castle, from the furniture to the waiter's clothes, the serving plates, and a surprising and refined menu. It is easy to imagine the luxury with which the archbishops of Narbonne must have received their guests. Since its beginnings, Christianity has been organized around one doctrine, theocracy. This doctrine led the lives of Christian men and women with the aim of saving their souls. For Christians, God is unique and infinitely good. He is the creator of all things, the kingdom of heaven and this world, peopled by man and by animals, his creatures. Death is not an end, but a passage to another life, that of the soul which will be saved and go to heaven for those who have been good, or be sent to hell for those who have done wrong. The great preoccupation of medieval man was therefore to save his soul in order that it rise to heaven after death. The mission of the Catholic Church was to save the souls of all men by showing them the way of truth and how to live their lives following the teachings of Christ 
and the foundation of Catholic doctrine. However, ever since the origins of Christianity, other theories had seen the light of day, deviating from the official doctrine. These Christianities were called heresies, from the Greek word heresis, which means choice, and adepts of these heresies were called heretics. Albi Cathedral was built to mark the Catholic fight against the Cathar heresy. It is a masterpiece of southern European Gothic architecture. It was the very fortress that became a dissuasive weapon in the defences of the town. Many contrary movements developed in the Middle Ages in Europe. The Paterines in Italy, the Publicans in the Champagne and Nivonnais areas, the Populicani in England, the Waldensians in Lyon and the Cathars in France and Italy. The Cathars in France were also known under the name of the Albigensians. This name has its origins in the area surrounding the town of Albi. The term Cathar was invented in 1163 by Canon Renan Ekber of Schönau, from the Greek Katharos, which means pure, and the Latin word Catus, meaning cat, to designate in a derogatory way heretics who were in adoration of cats. Albigensians was the first name given to them, referring to St. Bernard's mission in 1145, during which he was able to measure the extent of the phenomenon in the Albi area. Cathars never called themselves by the name Cathar. They called themselves apostles or Christian, and those faithful to them called them good Christians or good men or good women. Cathars were therefore Christian, but heretics in the eyes of the church in Rome since they rejected the official doctrine propounded by Rome. The origins of Catharism are complex and give rise to two theories. For some, Catharism has its origins in the Orient, in a real maze of far-off influences. Catharism spread in Europe in the 11th and 12th centuries and became solidly entrenched in the Languedoc in 1160. The second hypothesis considers that Catharism began directly in the south of France. In the Middle Ages, the enrichment of the church led to much degeneracy, for which it was heavily criticized. A protest movement developed, Catharism, to follow the message of poverty taught by Christ and forgotten by the church. Sainte Marie d'Orbieu Abbey in La Grasse was founded under the protection of Charlemagne. It was one of the most prosperous abbeys in the south of France.
the riches and splendor of the Catholic Church allowed it to impose and reinforce its authority against the most powerful lords of its world. So it was that in the 13th century, the Holy See controlled political life in many states and was the natural suzerain of all Catholic countries. These visible riches appeared, however, very far from the poverty preached by Christ, and protests were often made within the church itself. Thus, in the 12th century, the church wanted to make reforms, in particular with the help of the great monastic orders, such as the Cistercians. This was known as Gregorian reform. The riches of the Roman Church also led to jealousy of some feudal lords. This explains the favorable attitude adopted by many of them with respect to the Cathars. The south of France was the first region in the country to become part of the Roman Empire, and Narbonne was the capital of this province. With the barbarian invasions, the Visigoths came to settle in this region and in Spain. It is difficult to imagine when arriving in the village of Rennes-le-Château that the Visigoths had established a town here with no less than 30,000 inhabitants. The Visigoths were then driven out of the region by the Franks after the Battle of Vouillé and subsequently settled in Spain. With barbarian migrations, Saracen invasions and then Viking raids, insecurity and disorder descended on the west. This was only reversed when Charlemagne and his Carolingian Empire reunited the land once more. Chalabre Castle is unique in the Department of Aude and is a historical theme park. Visitors can participate in different activities, taking them back into the heart of the Middle Ages. Charlemagne's empire did not last. It crumbled and its former governors exercised power over their territories to their own advantage. Comment ça s'appelle ces tours rondes là aux angles Ça porte un nom ça, vous savez pas Comment Ok non, ça pourrait hein. Ça s'appelle les échauguettes. Les échauguettes, c'est une structure qui permettait de se protéger de la pluie, parce qu'on n'a jamais été attaqué ici. Hein. They still owed their allegiance to the King of France. They owed him assistance and help in war, and the exercise of law. In return, the king gave them protection and justice. Thus were created ties of vassalage. This type of relationship was reproduced at lower levels of society rather than direct vassals of the king. Great lords giving justice and protection to less powerful lords than themselves, promising help and counsel in government, war and justice in return. In this way, a very pyramid of vassals to the king was formed, with vassals of vassals, and so on down to the poorest people, those who had no vassals but who worked and paid taxes. This was known as the feudal system,
In the 12th century, the most powerful feudal lords of the south of France were the Counts of Foix, the Viscounts of Trincavel and the Counts of Toulouse. Nothing is more representative of the feudal system in popular imagery than the fortified castle. And the castles in Cathar country are some of the most impressive that you can find in Europe. The name given to them, Vertigo Castles, sums up the impression that they have on their visitors. Their position on precipitous and inaccessible summits bestow upon them an almost supernatural aura that cannot fail but to impress. A fine example is the castle of Queribus, which stands at an altitude of nearly 800 metres on a limestone crest, on the border between the country of Aude and the Pyrenees Orientales. The castle, as it is visible today, was built after the Albigensian Crusade. It is composed of various buildings dating from the 12th to the 16th centuries and marked the frontier with France and the lands belonging to the dominion of the kings of Aragon. Here were the Marche of Fenued. Only a few kilometers from Queribus, the fortress of Perpetus stands in the heart of the Corbières mountains, above the village of Duyac. The name Perpetus means a pierced stone, probably referring to the many natural cavities found in its enormous limestone base. These towering castles were the work of King Louis IX, better known under the name of Saint Louis, to mark the frontier with the lands of the King of Aragon. In this frontier zone, Perpertus Castle also shows the will to impose royal power through the vision of impressive castles. The aim was more than anything else to make a strong impression because these inaccessible fortresses were sparsely populated and their garrisons reduced to a minimum. Visiting them is still so impressive that it is easy to imagine the fortresses which preceded them in the same place, and which saw the Albigensian crusade and sheltered the Cathar heretics behind their ramparts amongst the inhabitants. The castles in Cathar country still stir the imagination today. You can visit the Corbia area by train, from Rivesalt in the Pyrenees Orientales area to Agzat in the Aude. The trip allows one to discover picturesque villages, vertiginous castles, 
and intact countryside. Puy-Laurent Castle was one of the last refuges of the Cathal leaders after the fall of Montségur in 1244. Immediately taken by the armies of the king, the primitive castle was altered and transformed. The small original fortification has given over to the audacious fortress that can be seen today. It is the best preserved fortified castle of all the great royal castles on the border. This eagle's nest stands at 695 meters above the gorges of the Bulzan River. Inside fortified castles, the feudal lord lived with his family in the keep. The example at Arc is one of the most remarkable and the most characteristic. 11 meters wide and 25 meters high, it is composed of four levels reached from a spiral staircase in the east turret. In this insecure era, people came together around the castles or castellum and formed hamlets and then villages. They in turn then encircled themselves with thick walls. These were called castrum or villages built around the castellum. Cathars did not live apart from the rest of the population and above all, did not live in closed communities like sects, cut off from the rest of the world inside inaccessible castles. On the contrary, they lived like everyone else, in Castrum, amongst the rest of the population, amongst Catholics. Las Tours has for a long time been considered as an ensemble, with its four feudal castles on a single site in the heart of the small valley of Orbiel. The castles of Cartineau, Fleurespine and the last Tour Regine were built after the 1226 Crusade. The oldest primitive castle is Cabaret, built around 1050. Excavations have demonstrated the presence here of a castrum a village, and have brought to light very significant remains concerning urban life. Within the villages or castrum, Cathars lived in community houses. There were separate houses for good men and for good women. The community house was directed by an elder for the good men and a superior for the good women.
Kon Minerwa Abbey is the only one in Cathar country to have a cloister with two stories. It is also well known for its shivi, apse, a masterpiece of Romanesque art. The Cathars had no abbeys or monasteries, nor churches or castles. Nevertheless, Cathar theology was complex and showed a deep knowledge of the Holy Scriptures. Unlike Catholics, Cathars believed that God could not be at the origin of evil. For Cathars, God, perfect and good, had only created good, the kingdom of heaven and souls. The earthly world and matter, animals and men, were the work of the devil, who also created evil. The human body was just an envelope, a prison for the soul. Souls did not perish, but were successively reincarnated in a body until they reached a degree of perfection that allowed them to rejoin the kingdom of heaven and eternal life. For Cathars, the end of the world meant that one day all souls would be saved and freed from their prisons. Man, as a material being, would have no further reason to exist, and Satan would be alone in his void. The end of the world was not then a catastrophe for the Cathars, but on the contrary, a liberation. The soul, or the spirit, was therefore the object of all divine consideration, whereas the material body was chastened. Not far from St. Papul Abbey, Sesak Castle dates from the 15th century and replaced its original fortress. Cathars obeyed the voice of truth, to which they considered themselves to be the only ones to have access. They rejected all the teachings of the Catholic Church because it was, in their eyes, a church of lies. Cathars rejected the sacrament of the altar, the most important in Catholic Christianity. They did not believe in the baptism of children, nor in the Eucharist. Cathars did not pray to saints or to the Virgin Mary. Their liturgy excluded all religious building and holy objects. They had no churches, no chapels, no altars and no relics. They celebrated their ceremonies in simple houses, community houses or houses belonging to believers. No holy object, no divine representations. The only furnishings were a table to hold the New Testament, a light and an aquamanil, a kind of ewer, for the ritual of washing hands. Mass was held in the vernacular and not in Latin, so that it could be understood by all those present. Those wishing to become bons hommes et bonnes femmes entered the community houses as novices. There was a probationary period of at least one year. The novice learnt a manual trade in a workshop situated in the house. They also had to learn by heart the first chapter of the Gospel of St. John and to be initiated into and practice ritual abstinence, poverty, chastity, obedience, community life and prayers. Since they believed in reincarnation, Cathars abstained from eating meat and any products of animal origin.
In these houses, Catho followers did manual work to support themselves. Like the apostles, they had a trade. Legend shows them all to be weavers, whereas in fact they were of many trades, like their contemporaries. The paper mill in the village of Bruce et Villaret shows the history of paper manufacture and organizes demonstrations of paper making by hand as well as lithography and engraving. At the end of their period as a novice, entrance into religious life was marked by ordination, the consolamentum. The believer who had received the consolamentum had achieved salvation, as long as he or she did not sin for the rest of their days. They now escaped the cycle of bodily reproduction that kept them bound to this earth. Their souls would no longer be reincarnated, but would rejoin the kingdom of God. After receiving the consolamentum, Cathars were called parfait or perfecti. They could then preach the Cathar faith. Cathar bishops were an itinerant clergy who delivered the sacraments and explained the gospels in houses, castles or village squares. Despite this, the Cathar church was very well organized. Its mission was a spiritual one, never temporal. Its role was to save souls, to rejoin the kingdom of God and attain eternal life there. The council at St. Felix Lauragais in May 1167, in the presence of Bishop Nisita of Constantinople, marked the historical founding of this church. Nothing proves that this council actually took place. Written material relating to it has never been authenticated. What is certain is that the Cathars made this council the founding act of their church. As Romulus and Remus were the founding legend of Rome, the council at St. Felix Lauragais is the legend at the origin of the Cathar Church. The castle in Term once presided over the Termenes area. It was a fortress with two large outer walls and long considered impregnable. It is difficult to imagine finding Christ's soul in this place. Nevertheless, one of the best known images of the castle is that of an opening in the wall in the shape of a Christian cross. The cross was not recognized by the Cathars as they did not recognize the signs and rituals of the Catholic Church. The Cathar Church was extremely well organized. Cathar churches were autonomous. Those in the Toulouse, Albi, Caucasus, Agen and Razes areas had good relations with their neighbours and Cathars were perfectly conscious of belonging to a single community. Their bishops did not have hierarchical superiors. 
they did not recognize the authority of the Pope in Rome. Cathars did not recognize the human nature attributed to Christ either. For them, Jesus had only taken on a human appearance to confuse Satan. Christ was divine, being descended on earth to teach the Gospels and to save souls kept prisoner. Unmasked by Satan, he was put to death. The Cathar Church believed that the suffering and the death of Christ were not the reason for his coming to earth but the consequence of it. Cathars obeyed an absolute rule. They could do no wrong, not even to the devil. Cathars therefore rejected the death penalty, even for criminals, because they considered that a good man slumbers inside all beings, even the cruelest, even the most evil. Limu Carnival is one of the best known and most picturesque in the area. It lasts no less than three months, from January to March. This tradition goes back to the 14th century. At that time, millers in Limu celebrated the paying of their tithes to Pui Monastery on the day of Mardi Gras, Shrove Tuesday. They paraded through the town, throwing sweets and flour over the crowd. The monks belonging to the abbeys were called upon by the Vatican to counter the Cathar heresy. The Catholic Church sent Cistercian missionaries to try and evangelize lost Christian sheep and to convince them to renounce the heresy. These itinerant preachers went from town to town, as did Bernard de Clairvaux who came to preach in the Languedoc in 1145. They organized public discussions with Cathar bishops to show people the truth was on the side of the Catholic Church. The medieval village of Fanjo is central to the history of the Dominicans. It was here that St. Dominic lived a part of his life and founded the order that bears his name. Legend tells that Dominic saw a ball of fire falling on Pruy. Seeing in this a sign from God, he founded the monastery and the order of Dominican monks here. Dominique de Guzman was born in Spain in 1170. In 1199, he joined the community of monks in the Cathedral of Osma, where for six years he was initiated into spiritual and community life according to the rule of St. Augustine. It was during a mission in Denmark in 1201 with Bishop Diego d'Azevedo that Dominic was confronted with the Cathar heresy in the Languedoc. In December 1206, the Pope sent Diego and Dominic, accompanied by some Cistercian legates, to evangelize the south of France. Like the Apostles, the party traveled in pairs, on foot, without money or belongings. In June 1206, Diego and Dominic arrived in Carcassonne, then Montréal and Fanjou. They organized a confrontation with the Cathars in March 1207. The theme was divided into different questions, prepared by each protagonist. The discussions and conclusions took place in public, 
to convince the Cathars of heresy publicly and solemnly. These debates lasted for several days. In each camp, referees transcribed points of view and passed sentence. This written transcription of debate marked a turning point in the procedure and predication of Catholic religious orders. It was so important that it gave rise to a legend. Legend has it that a parchment that St. Dominic threw into the flames flew away three times before landing on a beam of wood, thus showing the heretics which side divine providence had taken. However, no preacher, no confrontation, no writings would succeed in stopping the Cathar heresy. Moreover, the calls of the Pope on non-religious lords to eradicate the heresy went unheard. The latter were often tolerant with the new doctrine. Pope Innocent III chose Pierre de Castelnau from Fontfroide Abbey to meet Count Raymond VI of Toulouse in Saint-Gilles. It was here that the future of the south of France was engaged in 1208. One single event would change the course of history and be a deciding factor in the future of the south of France the assassination of the Pope's legate Pierre de Castelnau on the banks of the Rhone River. This act could not be linked with the Cathars, but despite this, the Pope decided to call on the King of France, Philippe Auguste, in the same year, 1208, and to start what history was to call the Albigensian Crusade, the first and only crusade of Christians against other Christians. <laughs>